jury trial. All about the tiger woman. Piper, Hexter. All about the day that murdered the hubby's ex-wife. Piper, Hexter, murder. Read all about it. Read all about the big murder trial. Read all about the day that murdered the hubby's ex-wife. All right, stand back and click this up. I'll show you what this is Where'd you take it? I haven't any, but I want to see the tigers. <laughs> Why don't you go to the zoo? You'll see a lot of them there, lady. <laughs> and a lot of them in Africa, too. It can't be done, ma'am, without a ticket. That courtroom's full in the sardine can right now. Oh, you know me. I've been to every murder trial this year. Okay, baby, pass right in. Maybe the judge will let you sit on his lap. <laughs> <laughs> All right, gangway now for the defendant. Make room for the defendant, please. Back up. Stand back. Tiger woman, huh? She doesn't look like she could kill a flea. Yeah, well, give a pretty woman a gun and an excuse. The result will be work for the coroner. She looks like a killer, all sleek and tigerish. I'd hate to have her on my trail. Did you see that cold looking thing? Did I see it? I felt it. Hey, tomorrow, let's bring our lunch. It'll be a picnic. That's it. And so, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, she sits between counsel and the former husband of the deceased, the latter for whom she killed in cold blood, the former on whom she depends to save her worthless, wretched life. A woman would describe her as chic, fetching, charming in her costume of black. I will admit that. Her counsel, Dennis O'Shea, and there is no better master of eloquence at the bar today will tell you she wears mourning for her child who died on the day of the tragedy. I tell you it is because black becomes her, makes her appealing to your eyes. La belle dame sans merci, the beautiful lady without mercy. Your Honor, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the eminent prosecutor has just paid compliment to my forensic ability, for which I wish to thank him. You've just heard the words from Keith Bourne, La Belle Dame Sans Merci, a beautiful lady without mercy. In this case, there was a beautiful lady without mercy, but she is not the defendant. She was the deceased. As this trial proceeds, let us forget the flow of legal eloquence, the continuous bickering of lawyers, the objections, the technicalities and interruptions which obstruct a clear insight into occurrences leading to the shooting. Rather, let us take the testimony in sequence of events. That will be a clear, coherent story, woven into one fabric, as told from the testimony of 40 witnesses, regarded as a painting from a master's brush, or a play from the pen of a dramatist, or a motion picture, or a book, or what you will. Mrs. Stanley is in the envelope. Oh, sure in. I think these will be all right with a few changes I've noted. See the draft gets them right away. All right. Hello. Well, darling, this is a pleasant surprise. That one could stand a lot of heating. Oh, you know I don't like to be kissed. <laughs> no, you never were very demonstrative. It isn't my nature. You know, darling, Sometimes I wonder... I suppose I'm too analytical to accept the popular conception of love. <laughs> love is just a brainstorm that explodes under high tension. Sometimes it's a peak. Then again, it misses fire the rest of its life. <laughs> We've only been married a year and you talking like that. Here, look at that. Ooh, beautiful. Have your plans been accepted? Well, I still have a little more work to do on them tonight, but they have this advanced tentative approval. Fine. Then you won't mind my telling you that my allowance has run out. 
Name it. Five hundred. You know, John, these little dabs of money don't last very long. Little dab? I don't know as I'd call this exactly a little dab. Well, thanks for it anyway. I simply have to be going. I suppose if you're going to work tonight, I'll have to go to Marge's party alone. I'll call for you. Oh, never mind. I'll manage splendidly. Besides, you'll probably be tired. Ah, 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 ah. Bye. Why the name of my rival? Joel Mason. Mason? Joel Mason. Do I know him? A young attorney. Rather successful one, I understand. Not that divorce specialist. I don't know what he specializes in. I only know he's handsome. Oh, really, dear? I'd rather you'd have nothing to do with men who make divorce their profession. Maybe I should play solitaire while you call on married women. Married women? <laughs> Why well, never call on married women except regarding plans? Plans? Yes, architectural plans. Oh, well, I wouldn't ask you to neglect your work. It'd be far better for you to be negligent of your wife. Eloise, darling, you've nothing to occupy your time. You know. I've always wanted... I won't be tied down. I don't like to. Where'd that come from? Oh, baby's a prize winner. Baby? Sired by my job. And damned by me and every other man whose wife prefers dogs to children. Look at him, baby. Don't let him talk like that about you. See? He knows you don't appreciate him. Appreciate him? <laughs> that cheap little mutt. He's neither a mutt nor cheap. I paid $500 for him. $500? For a dog? You object. Oh, no, no one objects to a dog in its rightful place, but... Well, I'm very fond of the little creature. Yeah, more so than me, it seems. Dogs and husbands are hardly comparable, John. Right. A dog's not a meal ticket. Do you mean you'd rather be free? Oh, oh, darling. I mean, I'd rather you'd be the sort of a wife I thought you'd be. Just what sort of wife does a man expect for a three-dollar marriage license and a wedding ring? Well, it seems to me that I've contributed more than that. I've given you my name and provided you with a home and catered to your whims. I have a right to expect something in return. Man's idea of marriage is being outmoded, Jim. Woman no longer wants to be monopolized. She wants a generous provider with a high social rating. Just where does love come in? Usually through the door and out the window. Of course you're joking. I assure you I'm far from it. My campaign was perfect. You thought you hardly had a chance when you proposed. Then just why did I put on my most becoming frock? Ask you to take me where I knew the music would be divine. Oh, John, you didn't have a chance of getting away from me. 
You must have thought me an awful fool. Oh, really? I never regarded it in that light. Man just hasn't a chance against a woman. You're right. Not when they want to break away. You're really beginning to learn, my dear boy. Well, you've led up to it very cleverly. When do you intend to file suit? That depends upon how soon a settlement can be arranged. You not want to be stingy, John. You want to know I'm well provided for. Darling, I'm sorry. Can't we begin all over again? Someday you will meet someone and be happy. There'll never be another woman. I've always loved you. There. You're just a little boy. Run along to bed, John. There's plenty of time to talk things over. Happy dreams. Good night. Baby, I almost feel sorry for you. Go to sleep now. Come on. This is the reception hall when completed. And, uh, the music room. Enough. Now, Mrs. Van, in the exteriors, you'll notice that I attempted to... John, you're a very remarkable young man. <laughs> I intend building a country home next spring. You'll design that, too. Something rural English, Norman, or Spanish? Oh, baronial, I think, with, uh, with battlements and towers and, and maybe a moat. Oh. oh, pardon me. Oh, thank you so much. It will be quite a show place. Something you can point to as an architectural achievement. Well, I, I hardly know how to thank you. I really don't deserve it. Oh, yes, you do, my boy. You have great talent, a lovely wife, and you're a very upright young man. Coming from you, that means a lot. Well, anyway, I've decided to lend a hand to your career. Oh, I hope I don't disappoint you. You never will. You come of good stock, and you hold everyone's respect. Thank you. You're, uh, you're going abroad, I believe. Yes, I shall be there during most of the winter and early spring. When I come back, the townhouse should be finished. And then I want you to have all your plans ready for the country place. Well, I shall devote the entire winter months to planning something, something of real beauty. Something you'll be happy to own and something that I'll be proud to have created. Oh, splendid. Pardon me. Yes? I'm Mr. Joel Mason, please. That's very important. Joel Mason? Well, I'm quite busy now. Joel? Oh, he's a dear boy. Do let him come in. All right. Send him in. A friend of yours? Oh, yes. You know, uh, I select my friends very carefully. It seldom one disappoints me. <laughs> and if he does? Well, if he does, uh, all friendship, even the most casual, ceases. Mr. Mason. Why, Joel. Good morning, Mrs. Van. John, I want you to meet a very fine boy, Joel Mason. <laughs> I think we've met before, haven't we? Why, yes, I believe we have. I want you two boys to know each other better. Oh, I'm sure we shall. I'm sorry to intrude, but I have a little business that, if you weren't too occupied, but really nothing important. Well, Mrs. Van and I were merely discussing some house plans. I'll drop in next time I'm oh, in the building. Oh, no, no, I must hurry along. Luncheon at the Ritz, a matinee in company for dinner. Uh, John, show Joel your drawings. He's interested in beauty. My love to the charming Eloise. Bye, Joel. Thanks so much for coming in. Oh, not at all. You're going far in your profession, my boy. You'll always have well-paying clients. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Yeah. I've been to no one until further notice. Cigarette? No, thanks. 
I prefer to guard. Nice office you have here, Mr. Thurman. Very nice. Well, I suppose you know why I'm here. Yes, I have an idea. Your wife has talked this over with you? Yes, but she can't be serious about this. I'm afraid she is serious, Mr. Thurman, though I've tried to reason with her. Yes, I can picture an attorney talking himself out of a case. Well, after all, divorce is becoming equally important with marriage. More so, I'd say, with divorce attorneys. There is no charge you wish to bring against your wife? Of course not. I would do nothing to harm her. I love my wife. Believe me, Mr. Thurman, it's a pleasure to meet a man of your caliber. A man who refuses to drag his wife's name in the mire. Oh, my wife can't be serious. She doesn't intend to go through with this madness. I'll talk to her again. Mrs. Thurman has taken quarters in a very secluded hotel. Well, I've never refused my wife anything she wanted. If she wants a divorce, she may have it. But let's get it over with as quickly and as quietly as possible. There is, of course, some property. Yes, there's around $40,000 in stocks and bonds, I think. Which you will share with her? Oh, she can have it all. I'm doing very well in my profession, and she has no means of earning a livelihood. That's very good of you. I'm sure she'll appreciate that, and salt it away for a rainy day if she takes my advice. Mrs. Thurman should live very handsomely on her alimony. Alimony? I hadn't thought of that. Why, surely you're not going to leave her to the mercy of stock market fluctuations, are you? Cost 500 a month. With Mrs. Thurman's social obligations, I should think that uh, a thousand would be more suitable. What? Oh, of course, she has no desire to hamper you in your career. She'd rather skimp than. All her. right, all right, make it a thousand. I suppose that my wife will go to Reno or Mexico or. As far as I am concerned, Reno and Mexico are out. There is danger of our state courts declaring such divorces invalid. The law here permits divorce only on one ground. I prefer to keep my reputation clean. The suit will be filed and tried secretly. No publicity whatever. Of course, Mrs. Thurman can't be expected. Oh, all right, all right, anything that she wants. That's very good of you. I'll arrange the little details you do not understand. Believe me, Mr. Thurman, you're a real man. A gallant, chivalrous gentleman. That's quite a lot of praise for giving a woman something she would take anyway. Mrs. Thurman will be proud of you. Yes. I don't care to know. Thank you. I was told... Not that interested. Sit down over there. Thank you. Will I have long to wait? You're being paid for it, aren't you? Yes. I needed the money terribly. 
Yes, that seems to be what all women need. Well, it's hard enough to live on $25 a week. But when that starts... I had an idea that girls of your profession were paid rather well. Should be, anyway. I don't spell any too well. That's my trouble. Spell? What is spelling to do with your profession? Well, letters, of course. I have to write letters all the time. Oh, I hardly thought that was necessary, but you don't need to worry about any misspelled words in my letters. Well, that's funny. Mr. O'Shea couldn't stand an incorrectly spelled word. Mr. O'Shea? The criminal lawyer. He was my last employer. He said he could defend any crime except a stenographer's poor spelling. Stenographer? Well, I thought you were talking about love letters for evidence. I'm a stenographer out of a job. First time I ever did anything like this. Do you expect me to believe that? I suppose not. Do you know? Somehow I believe you're telling me the truth. I am. It's nice of you to think so. Well, how did you get rung in on this mess? You see, I live with another stenographer. A girl who works for Joel Mason. She knew I needed money to send home. Needed it so badly, I'd do almost anything to get it. So she talked Mason into giving me a hundred dollars to come here tonight. Come on, you have to get out of here before they come. Well, didn't you hear me? Come on, I said get out of here. But I can't. They've already paid me and I've sent the money home. Well, well that's all right. I'll repay Mason. This is the way What's this doll? Where is she? We know you're hiding a woman in here after midnight. We saw her come up. Stand aside, young man. We want to see that woman. This is a good, clean kid, and I won't have her mixed up in this sort of a mess. All we want to do is take a look. We don't need to make an arrest. You touch this door and I'll push that smile a foot down your throat. Suppose I show you a warrant. If you do it, I'll make you eat it. Send Mrs. Thurman in. There's no need to identify this woman. All we want to know that is that there is a woman in there. Yeah, you know there's one in there, all right. You sent her. She's too decent a girl to be mixed up in this sort of business. I didn't think you'd do this, John. You knew I'd do anything for you. That's why you came up here tonight. Let's see her. Oh, no. You'll have to find some other dirty way of shoving me. This is a good, decent girl, but foolish enough to risk her good reputation to try and earn a few dollars to send home to her family. Here I am. Why did you do this? Now you've seen me, I'll take a look at you. Well, just as I thought. You've done enough damage for one night. You may leave now. There's no need for us to remain here any longer. Sorry, John. Sorry that one of your own sex could read in two seconds what a man couldn't see in two years. I... I hope you'll forgive me for letting you remain. But why did you let them see you? I was afraid you might go back to her. Oh, what possible difference could that make to you? Oh, none at all. I wouldn't let it. Only I don't think women like her deserve men like you. You hardly know me. Well, we only know what we think. Sometimes it isn't safe to think too much. Goodbye. Uh, well, uh, uh, what is your name? Well, it doesn't matter. Where are you going? Where every nice little girl should be at this hour. I'm going home. Goodbye. <laughs> hey, turn off that buzz saw.
Hey, wake up. Wake up. I never heard so much snoring. Oh, I never snore. No? When I opened the door, I thought I was walking into a thunderstorm. Say, how'd you come out? Lucky I wasn't thrown out. What'd you do? Gun the work? Oh, I suppose so. And after me recommending you. Oh, well, I'll be named all right. Mason got all he needed anyway. Thurman got fresh, honey. You popped him one? No. Mrs. Thurman got fresh, and I almost popped her one. Tell me, what happened? Well, Mr. Thurman thought I was too nice a girl to be a correspondent. So he hid me in a back room just as they all broke in. Go on, go on. There was a terrible row because he wouldn't let them see me. So then I stepped out and told Mrs. Thurman what I thought of her. That must have made a hit with Joel. It wasn't Joel I was thinking of. It was John. Oh. So it's John and Joan already. Fast work. Well, it's a good thing you got your pay in advance. When I came in, he wouldn't listen to my name. And when I went out, I wouldn't tell him. All he has to do is ask Mason. I don't think they'll be on speaking terms after tonight. I told him I lived with you. So, if he should phone, you don't know anything, not even where you live. I get you one way, and still I don't savvy you another. You're goofy about the guy, and you never want to see him again. Well, I guess I can hold out if I never see him again. But if I'd have stayed there ten minutes longer, I'd have told him I was dizzy about him. Think you wouldn't rate, huh? He'd probably have hysterics. Oh, what does his wife look like? An orchid? Yeah, that's it, an orchid. Cold and beautiful and a parasite. Well, honey, you made a hundred bucks for the old folks anyway. Mm -hmm. Say, Mary, do you think I could ever learn to spell well enough to be a stenographer in a high-class office? Oh. Oh, good morning. Good morning, Miss Harkness. Sorry, I'm late. Any important calls? Mason's been calling again. He says your alimony payments are behind three months. What's this? I marked an article I thought might interest you. Any answer from my cables to Mrs. Van? None at all. I cabled all the hotels on her itinerary. London, Paris, Rome, Cannes. Mr. Mister all around. I'm afraid she's purposely ignoring your messages. That thought occurred to me, but it isn't like Mrs. Van. If anything displeases her, she hits right out from the shoulder. I've worked particularly hard all winter on those plans for her country house, and now they're ready for inspection. If she should get in soon, it'll be a piece of luck. Mason's getting pretty ugly. Yeah. I'll phone him. Any dictation today? We'd better get out some letters to all outstanding accounts and urging immediate payment. <laughs> I'm afraid that's useless. The Bell Estate is in litigation. Mr. Worthington is in Europe. And Ransom has gone into bankruptcy. How about Mrs. Clifford Dow? Mrs. Dow is in Palm Beach. Palm Beach? Well, I'm afraid if we don't make some collections pretty soon, you'll be out of a job and I'll be in jail. Um, I was going to speak about that. Would it inconvenience you any if I resign? Better offer? I wouldn't say better. Perhaps a little more stable. I see. Afraid the old ship might go down at any moment, huh? You know I wouldn't think of leaving, except that I have dependents. <laughs> it's all right. It's a wise move, not only on your account, but mine. You mean my work hasn't been satisfactory? Oh, quite. No, I mean it would be a saving if I employed a stenographer who could take a few letters and also act as receptionist. Well, with business so slow as it is, you hardly need an executive secretary. 
Oh, I almost forgot. There's a Mr. Anderson waiting to see you. Mr. Anderson? Have we had any business dealings before? No, I think not. He said a third party referred him to you about a house. About a house? We'll show him in. Oh, Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. How do you do, Mr. Anderson? Yeah. Understand you want to see me about a house. That's right. What kind of a house? Oh, a big house. In fact, a courthouse. Well, I've designed a lot of them. Yeah? Well, this one has designs on you. Here's a citation for contempt of court. Contempt of court? Mm-hmm. You must be a little behind your alimony, ain't you, buddy? Alimony? Yeah. That's the salve for wounded dames. Name and occupation. Antonio Giuseppe Ponessa. Oh, hello, Tony. You back? Yeah, the old lady, she told a lie to George. She says, I got it the money, but I no pay. What do you do with your money, Tony? I pay the lawyer man to keep me old. Well, you take my advice and pay your old lady. That's the way to keep out of here. Get over there. Name and occupation. Collins. James Collins. Newspaper reporter. Well, there's his commitment over there, the one from Judge Greer's court. Huh. Greer's been sending a batch of them over here. He's the divorcee's champion, all right. Well, I'll stay here and rot before I'll give her a cent. <laughs> That's a tune they all whistle when they come in. But when they go out, they sing a different song. Well, suppose I did want to pay her. No job, no money, and locked up. The judge never thought of that, I suppose. How will you have your eggs in the morning? Sunny side up or over easy? Go on, get over there. John Thurman. Alimony arrears. That's you, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Rather a new experience for a man like you, Mr. Thurman. I hope you can put up with our accommodations. <laughs> I never thought I would occupy the place when I designed the building. Oh, I thought I'd seen your name somewhere before. It's on the cornerstone. <laughs> Well, the man who created the guillotine was beheaded by it. The man who invented the electric chair was executed in it. <laughs> now the man who designed the alimony jail is being incarcerated in it. <laughs> <coughs> Check your valuables here. You can keep your cigars and cigarettes. Thanks. Hello. You gonna be with us for supper, son? Hail, hail, the gang's all here. Quick, boy! New customers come. Let's get ready. is now in session. <clears throat> Gentlemen, you are charged with defrauding women. I mean stealing horses. Guilty or not guilty? Guilty. <laughs> what else <laughs> <come back? laughs> That's that. You mean they can keep him in alimony jail because he can't pay that woman a thousand dollars a month? If the court thinks he can pay and he doesn't, they can keep Thurman there indefinitely. It's about the only form of debt in America that can jail a man. Well, she doesn't deserve a nickel. Lived with him less than a year, then let a shyster frame him so he'd have to slave for her the rest of his life. How do you know so much about this case? Well, I was the girl Mason planted in Thurman's office. Joan! In case you don't understand the circumstances, I'll give you a few details. After I lost my job here, I couldn't get another for weeks. My family out west were in desperate need of money. I saw a chance to earn a hundred dollars, and I took it. But that was collusion, going up there with the intention of deceiving the court. Why well, should report this to the trial judge? But a lawyer can't betray his client's confidence. He has a dime as retainer's fee. Oh, thanks. Of all the messes, well, the woman's a moral cheat. Her husband's a ninny for signing his life away. The lawyer's a crook, and you're a little fool. 
Well, I'll thank you not to call John Thurman a ninny. I suppose you'd like to go to jail so you could be near him. I haven't seen him in six months. It's been like six years. Now, I'm warning you. This fellow's getting everything he deserves. You know, there's only one reason why a man insists upon being a martyr. He's afraid the world will condemn him if he stands up against a parasitical wife. So he pretends to be chivalrous. I suppose even you will admit there are times when alimony is justifiable. Yes, times without number. Usually when a man goes into court and fights like a wildcat, to keep some woman from getting what she's entitled to. Well, now that's settled. How about a habeas corpus? I think we'd better try a hocus pocus. Get me attorney Joan Mason on the phone, please. It's all a bluff, Joan. If I took you into court and exposed Mason, they put you all where you belong, in jail. Hello. Mason? This is Dennis O'Shea. Yes, I'm calling in behalf of a client of mine. Yeah, Joan Armstrong. Yeah, she was at that little affair in Thurman's office last year. I'm wondering if it'd be necessary for me to go into get a writ of habeas corpus to bring Thurman into court. Or would you do me a favor and ask Judge Greer for a court order? Well, I'm sure he intends to pay. Thank you, Mason. You can be my lawyer anytime. You sit down there and listen to some good advice. Just because this fellow's out temporarily doesn't mean that he won't have to pay. The alimony laws in this state have so many teeth they make an alligator's mouth look as barren as a hen's beak. What a farce this place is. The alimony club is the greatest social leveler in the world. Millionaires, playboys, day laborers, all pals are here. <laughs> Some won't or can't pay their former wives thousands a month in alimony. Others won't or can't give up ten or twelve dollars a week. Ah, oh, this place has got me down in the dumps. Ah, you like it, all right. I wish I could get out and get a little sunshine or something. Say, how about a sing? The last one I got. I don't want to take your last one. Go ahead, you got it. It's Thanks. Grand smoker. You see that little walk there, spreading the cigarette with the American? Yes. He gets three dollars a day digging ditches when he has a job. The other fellow is Davy Dugan. Quit supporting his ex-wife and kiddies so he could feed a string of polo ponies. Well, this isn't so bad after all, is it, Tom? You'll get used to it. Sure. Who's that old fellow with the white hair? A sugar daddy with a flair for showgirls. Wife had to get a divorce and take him washing. Hey, wait a minute. I'm still in there. Well, sit down. No one's trying to cheat you, pal. Well, you better not. That's my card. Now there's a heavyweight prize fighter who never took the count. His wife weighs 105 pounds and how she took him. <laughs> He's taking the count now, I'd say. A long. Two years already. Everybody here swaps tobacco and thinks they have a contempt for women. My old woman's doing the Riviera. Money I've already paid. Can't understand there was a depression. How about yours? Oh, I only hear indirectly. Through lawyers is a pretty direct and definite communication. Have a seat. Thank you. Uh, call John Thurman. John Thurman. You. 
Well, I helped to get you in here. So I decided it was up to me to get you out. You get me out? Mm hmm I need a job. My spelling's improved a lot. Good morning, Joan. Oh, good morning, Mr. Thurman. I hope I haven't kept a long line of clients waiting this morning. No, I told them all to come back next year. Tell them you had all you could possibly do for months. <laughs> yes, in the two months you've been here, I've had just one client, Mr. O'Shea. And you brought him in. I have a grand surprise for you. Surprise? Mm -hmm. You know that Mrs. Van you cabled all over Europe? Yes. She's on her way here. Telephoned about an hour ago. Mrs. Van? Why, well, I'd almost given up hope hearing from her. I've got all her plans and sketches out of the drafting room. You... She'll want to see them. Oh, yes. You know, these plans represent months of hard work, Joan. Here, come on, let's clear the desk and have the exhibit ready for her. Get this out of the way and help her. There we are. Come on. Well, come on and help. Don't stand there and gape. What's the matter with you? Set that phone on there to hold it down. That's right. There. How's that? Well, they're marvelous. I'm sure she'll be pleased with them. Oh, she's very discriminating. She can read values at a glance. Architecture, paintings, people, anything. Well, then I'm sure she wouldn't like it if there was no one in the reception room to meet her. <laughs> oh, I almost forgot. Make out two checks for a thousand dollars each. One to uh, Mrs. Eloise Thurman and the other one to Joel Mason. Uh, have the first converted into a draft to be mailed to her London hotel. The one to Joel Mason, just mark it to legal services. Well, I'm afraid there isn't enough money in the account to cover both checks. Oh, that's all right. Mrs. Van will make a down payment of $10,000. You can deposit that when you make out the draft for Mrs. Thurman. Very well. Oh, I'm so sorry. I must have kept you waiting. Merely a slight inconvenience. Why, Mrs. Van, I thought you were lost. I cabled everywhere for you. Uh, kindly have this young woman remain. Certainly. I wish her to hear why I didn't answer your cables. Well, uh, this is my new secretary, Miss Armstrong. How do you do? Won't you please sit down? I... I hope there's been no misunderstanding. None whatever. I understand everything perfectly. Has Miss Armstrong done anything that you disapprove of? I presume she's no more to blame than you. I met Eloise in Cannes some months ago. Poor child. She confided in me about the divorce. Said she'd come abroad to forget. Eloise wanted a divorce. Naturally, under the circumstances. I'm sorry, I can't explain. John, I very much regret that I so misread your character. Of course, you understand I can't have my name connected with scandal in any possible way. I'm sorry now that I gave you my business, sponsored you among my friends. Your conduct forces me to... Withdraw all future patronage. But, Mrs. Van, I've... Well, I've worked particularly hard all winter on your plans, and now they're ready for your inspection. The house will not be built for some time, and when I get ready to go ahead, I shall consult another architect. Don't you consider that you did enough in breaking up his home without coming here to flaunt yourself in his public life? I only came here to help. You call this helping him? Where is your shame? Miss Armstrong is absolutely innocent of any wrong. I prefer not to discuss that subject. I trust my change in plans will not interfere with your successful career. Good day.
Don't cry, dear. We'll get along some way without her help. I don't mean anything to you. And she does. Why don't you go to her and tell her you're rid of me? But I'm not rid of you. And I'll never want to be. I got you in trouble that night. And I got you in trouble again today. Well, you rescued me from the alimony jail and brought me my only client in months. You never even noticed the rose I brought you. Rose? The one you knocked off the desk. Oh. Do you really want me to stay? Forever and ever. Guess what? That Thurman guy in the can again? <laughs> look out, look out! You'll make me break these eggs. I'm married. Married? Oh, <laughs> look out or you'll break the eggs. Well, who's the goose? John Thurman. John Thurman? Now we broke the eggs. We broke the eggs. Well? Say, you better get that cleaned up. You know what they'll do to you here if they find you cooking. What you gonna live on? Mrs. Thurman's alimony? Well, oh, I argued and argued with John. I told him that he wasn't making enough to afford a wife and pay alimony as well. Oh, yeah? You argued, huh? How long? Until I was afraid I'd convince him. Oh, well, I won't mind. We'll just have a little place and I'll do all the work. Even the laundry. I'd be glad to share anything with him. Sure. You'll scrub while the ex-Mrs. Thurman dances. You'll wear last year's dress while that orchid's buying new evening gowns on your husband's money. Oh, no. I've already seen Dennis O'Shea. He says the courts will reduce John's alimony. Okay, sister. But any time you get lonely and your husband's in the jailhouse, that little Betty will be waiting for you. doing? Making a dress? Yes. It's my very first creation. Like it? Well, yes, but I thought I gave you money to buy a dress. Well, I looked all over downtown, and I couldn't find anything half as becoming as this. You're not pinching pennies, are you, dear? No. But I thought it would be a saving, and you'll like the dress just as well. First it's cooking and washing, and now it's dressmaking. Joan, dear, you should have a maid. I don't need one, darling. It's my part of the bargain. And keeping it makes me very happy. <laughs> Besides, I have you. Oh, I'll answer. Poor kid. Mr. Mr. Anderson says he wants to see you about a house. Hello. 
Your ex is clamoring for more soothing syrup. How far in the rear is this, the defendant? Your Honor, almost two thousand dollars. You've been here several times before, haven't you? Yes, Your Honor. I believe I cut your alimony in half some months ago. Well, business has been very bad, Your Honor. And Your Honor, I don't wish to seem to persecute this man, but I must insist that he live up to his obligations to his former wife. Your Honor has already committed him to the delinquent jail, and I've had him before you several times. All right. Well, what do you want to do? Go back to jail again? Oh, I gave her $40,000 in stock when we were divorced. Granted, Your Honor, but that stock today is practically valueless. I've done everything I can to keep up the payments, but I'm a married man you now. You couldn't pay your alimony, but you married another woman. The defendant has since married the correspondent in this case. This court has been very lenient with this defendant on several prior occasions. The fact that he married the woman who broke up his wife's home is certainly no recommendation for further leniency. Please, Your Honor, may I say something? You may. Well, my husband gave me $100 to buy some clothes, and I'd gladly pay Mrs. Thurman's attorney if it would keep Mr. Thurman out of jail. You the second Mrs. Thurman? Yes, and I want to do everything I can to help you. The plaintiff's attorney will give you a receipt. Case continued for 30 days. Unless a substantial sum is paid to your former wife within that time, you will be sent to the jail for alimony delinquents. Next case. Carroll versus Carroll. Stop crying, darling. Don't be so despondent. It won't be like this always. Oh, yes, it will. Every dollar you earn, she'll want. Every time I need a new dress, I'll have to remember that the money must be saved for her. No, no, no. I thought we could live on nothing. And love was all that mattered. But I know different now. We've got to eat and have clothes the same as she does. Well, maybe she'll remarry. Oh, no. No, she won't. Not as long as she can bleed you and make me miserable. <laughs> oh, I was a fool to get you into this. But I'll, uh, I'll give you your freedom. Oh. Oh. Oh, I'm so sorry. I just couldn't control myself. It's my nerves, I guess. Oh, it's been an awful day for you. No, it isn't that. It's that I'm going to have a baby. Oh, Joan, darling. Joan? Yes? Can't you keep Johnny quiet? I'll try, darling. Boo! <laughs> it's for Johnny. His first birthday cake. <laughs> Silly. He can't eat cake. <laughs> oh, I know. He likes to light his candle and you and I can eat the cake. Afraid there hasn't been much cake in our lives, has there? I guess cake wasn't meant for us. You know, dear, I don't know whether I'm ever going to get out of this alimony hole. 
Sometimes I wonder if it wouldn't be wise if we pulled up stakes and went to Canada or somewhere and started all over again without this handicap. Oh, no, I'd never do that. I'd rather stay here and work than let her think she made us hide. <laughs> the old guard never surrenders, huh? I should <laughs> say not. Besides, I know you'll succeed someday, darling. John, I don't want to worry you, but aren't you behind in Eloise's payments again? Yes, I am. Joan, darling, would you be angry if I dropped by and had a talk with her and asked her if she couldn't reduce her living expenses so that it wouldn't be so hard on you? No, I've stood for everything but that. I don't want you to go near her, even speak to her. I guess I'd better go and try and quiet him. The candle will amuse him. Well, here, here, let me light it first. There you are. Look, Johnny. Look at the pretty cake. It's for your birthday. Look, honey. all day, but... Why, he's burning up. I think you better go for a doctor right away. All right. Oh. Oh, poor baby. <laughs> the child's facing a very serious illness. How long has he had this cold? About a week. Settled in both lungs. Please get this filled immediately at the nearest drugstore. I'll get a coat. Is it, is it really serious, Doctor? Yes. And to keep the room well ventilated and give the medicine according to the directions on the label. Yes. I'll be right back. You better call me again later this afternoon if he doesn't improve. Yes, thank you, Doctor. Hey! Hey! Listen, I'm getting sick and tired of coming out here for you. Why don't you move in closer to the judge's court? Well, my baby's very ill. I've got to go to the drugstore and get this prescription. Wait Jill. a minute. You're always full of excuses. Well, it's only a citation. I'll appear at the proper time. Yeah? Well, this time it's a bench warrant and Judge Greer's waiting for you. Well, I'm not going. No? Well, now, are you going to ride peaceably or are you going to ride with these? Well, just a moment. Just a moment. Nothing. Come along with me. And, uh, that's all I can say. I've listened to your excuses for the last time. I'll be able to make a payment next week if you'll just let me go. Your Honor, this man has been a persistent violator of the orders of the court in regard to his alimony. There is illness in the home of his former wife, and she cannot wait until next week for the money. Well, if you'll only let me explain. In the past year, this court has wasted a great deal of valuable time listening to your explanations. I do not care to hear any more excuses in this matter. Well, I only have $20, Your Honor, and I need that desperately. Give her the money to Mr. Mason. I'll give you a receipt for it. I can't wait. Here it is. They arrested me on the way to the drugstore. They forced me to go to court. They took that $20 bill, the last money I had. You let them uh, drag you off to court. You let them rob you of your last $20 while my baby was dying? It took me 
took me a long time to convince that druggist that I would pay him tomorrow. Tomorrow? Something that was valuable only today. You mean... the baby's worse? By the time I could get the doctor back, Johnny was dead. The doctors say you may hold baby, Mrs. Thurman. Oh, mother darling. And he says he must have four ounces of prepared milk, one teaspoon of grated spinach, and three drops of paragoic. Him little tummy hurt. And here's the bill. Oh, just put it on the table, Paul. Mother. Yes. I'm not at home to anyone but my attorney. Well, there's the baby. Mother's so glad to see him. Yes, he's been away. I told her you weren't in, madam, and she brushed me aside when I tried to stop her. Well, I've come here to settle things. To settle things for once and all. The courts have settled everything, as far as I'm concerned. You have my husband. John is my husband. I should have said my former husband. And your present meal ticket. How long do you intend to go on bleeding him for alimony? Robbing his family of every cent he earns? I believe a woman collects alimony until she remarries. Your kind never remarries. You're just a parasite. There. You're getting poor sick baby nervous. You call that thing baby. If you'd have been a real mother, you'd have still been John's wife and entitled to his earnings. Now that you've so rudely intruded, perhaps you'll be good enough to go. There, baby, darling. There, baby. Go to sleep, honey. Yes, your mother, little darling. Sleep, honey. Yes, sir. Twenty dollars. Phone the police. Thank you, Mrs. Thurman. That's all, Your Honor. Your witness. No further questions. This is our tragic story. The defense asks for an instructive verdict of not guilty. There is nothing more to add to the state's case. In the opinion of this court, the jury should render its own verdict in this case. Therefore, the motion for an instructed verdict is hereby denied. Before retiring to consider the evidence, which the court considers clear and decisive, the jurors will be instructed as to the various degrees of murder as defined by the penal code. Mrs. Thurman, now that the jury has exonerated you, I want you to go home with your husband and begin life anew and unhampered. <laughs>